When I was a kid acting up in the back seat of our 1955 Chevy Bel Air, my dad would turn around and say, Don't make me stop this car. If I have to come back there, there's going to be hell to pay. Well, today the world's scientists are saying something like that to all of human society. But the hell to pay will be administered by Mother Nature. We'll dig into this and much more on this episode of Growth Busters. Calling, 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 calling. Call the Growth Buster. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Welcome to the Growth Busters podcast about one planet living. I am Dave Gardner, your co-host. Flying solo today, Erica is unable to join me. If you find this episode enlightening, engaging, stimulating, be sure to visit growthbusters.org to explore these issues further. The scientists of the world issued their first group warning that we were driving human civilization off a cliff over 25 years ago. Well, those pesky scientists are up to it again and getting in the way of growth boosters, neoclassical economists, fossil fuel conglomerates, real estate developers, and other growth profiteering capitalists, the people who deny that there are limits to growth. In this episode, we'll talk about the latest world scientist warning and have a conversation with Stuart Scott, the guy who stepped up to help the scientists speak to the public. First, a quick history of world scientists' warnings. In 1992, 1,700 of the world's leading scientists, including the majority of Nobel laureates in the sciences, issued an appeal titled World Scientists' Warning to Humanity. Its introduction stated, Human beings and the natural world are on a collision course. Human activities inflict harsh and often irreversible damage on the environment and on critical resources. If not checked, many of our current practices put at serious risk the future that we wish for human society and the plant and animal kingdoms, and may so alter the living world that it will be unable to sustain life in the manner that we know. Fundamental changes are urgent if we are to avoid the collision our present course will bring about. Well, 25 years later, a group of scientists evaluated our response and gauged our progress in cleaning up our act. And two years ago this week, they gave us our report card. And I'm afraid we got a failing grade. They issued another warning published in the journal Bioscience. This was called World Scientist Warning, A Second Notice. Now, it's interesting. The lead author, William Ripple at Oregon State University, initially sent this paper out to 40 of his colleagues. After 24 hours, 600 scientists had signed it. Within two days, that number was up to 1,200. There were so many people signing that the OSU website actually crashed a couple of times. By the time the paper was ready for publication, the authors had received the endorsement of over 15,000 fellow scientists from 184 countries. And that number later swelled to over 25,000. Now, Stuart Scott is the founder and executive director of the Union of Concerned Citizens of Earth. He's taken on the mission of helping the world's scientists communicate well with everyday people. In February of this year, 2019, Stuart and I had an extended conversation about his role in all this. I hadn't published that yet just hadn't gotten around to it, but I thought I should dust it off and finally share it this month as we approached the two-year anniversary of the World Scientist's second warning. Well, while I was getting it ready, lo and behold, the scientists came out with a third warning. Realizing we don't have another 25 years to pussyfoot around, the Alliance of World Scientists issued World Scientist's Warning of a Climate Emergency. 11,000 scientists endorsed it, and it was published in the November-December issue of the journal Bioscience. Reading from this new warning, We declare clearly and unequivocally that planet Earth is facing a climate emergency. To secure a sustainable future, we must change how we live. This entails major transformations in the ways our global society functions and interacts with natural ecosystems. The warning ends by offering, and I quote, six critical and interrelated steps that governments, businesses, and the rest of humanity can take to lessen the worst effects of climate change, end quote. Now, these steps fall into the headings of energy, short-lived pollutants, 
Nature, Food, Economy, and Population. It's a quick read, so be sure to check the show notes for a link. Now, obviously, the third warning wasn't a part of the conversation Stuart Scott and I had back in February. Before I share that conversation, let me first advise you to be sure and stick around to the very end, because at the end of this episode, I will turn you on to two brilliant and short essays that were just published this week and are required reading. And let me prepare you for what you're about to hear. If Robin Williams were, one, alive today, and two, a dedicated sustainability advocate, an interview with him might be a little like this conversation with Stuart Scott. Stuart's not quite as manic as Robin Williams could be, but he does have boundless energy, and his mind jumps quickly from good idea to good idea. As a result, this episode is a bit of a stream-of-consciousness ramble. Have a listen. While I was dressing, I'm, my thoughts are roaming over the chaos upstairs and the fact that I've packed up the uh, LPs. You remember the acronym LP yeah. from my, my earlier days, which I've kept with me all these years, and they're in crates now. And I told my housemate, hey, Joby, either I need to get rid of those records or buy a turntable. And he said, oh, yeah, we can bring them down to Goodwill. And I said, no, I was thinking the opposite. And he said, why would you want to do that, essentially? And, and I said, because, you know, if I'm right, if what we're saying is right, then society is going to go through a decline where the current forms of, of entertainment, listening to YouTube, will be the first to go. And then the forms of local music. Oh, I saved my music on a thumb drive, not in the cloud. It's on a thumb drive. Those will be next to go because you'll be able to generate electricity for your computer a few years more. You'd better save your ukulele, though. (laughs) Better. I better get one. And then finally, the LPs will arise again. While somebody rides a bike to generate the electricity, perhaps. I'll send you a link to a very cute YouTube that has that. Remind me. Oh, or you can Google it. Make a note if you've got a pad. Robert Newman, The History of Oil. It's a YouTube, which is just rib splitting. Very droll humor. Wonderful. Great. Stuart Scott, I'm so excited to have you on the Growth Busters podcast. Way overdue. I've been so impressed with the work that you've been doing. And some of our listeners may not know very much at all about the World Scientist's Warning. So would you be willing to give us a little bit of background about that? Sure, more than willing. I grew up with a concern for the planet. An unnatural, as it turns out, concern for the planet. I was also good at making money as a kid. I was the only kid for blocks around who could actually make a profit with a lemonade stand. (laughs) So anyhow, and through my life, I've kind of been a bit of a, I don't want to say oddball, wrong, maverick, an outlier in statistical terms. I've, I've been able to go places and do things that other people wouldn't conceive of. So I was, for instance, a, uh, a minstrel making my living, living in a van, working two days a week on the weekends, when tourism was high, selling something, a musical instrument to the tourists. So I don't tell that story very much because it doesn't seem to impact what I'm doing now. But it does in a way because it gave me a sense of the heart of a group. So I have this sixth sense, shall we call it, of what a group is feeling and what an individual is feeling. We're all sensitive to that if we pay attention to it. So I'm an empathetic person. And Uh what greater being to be empathetic with than... Mother Nature, the planet Earth, Gaia, as it's variously called, this huge web of life that we live within, but in our own human hubris think that we're the only one who's got any intelligence. We're the only intelligent part of it. Of course. So I was listening to Jane Goodall, a little fragment yesterday where she's telling about that uh aha moment or those uh aha moments with the chimps when she realized they're sentient beings. She didn't say it that way, but, you know, they are sapiens. We are called, very pridefully, (laughs) homo sapiens. We named ourselves wise monkeys, homo sapiens. Yeah, we were way premature on that judgment call. And I've heard us called other things. You know, I don't know what the Latin for greedy is or short-sighted or selfish, but somebody gave me a different word for uh, homo what. Anyhow, we are not the only forms of life that are intelligent. But, and in fact, we are probably on some dimensions, 
at the bottom of the intelligence uh, hierarchy because we are the only one that seems to be permanently driving ourselves in extinct. Well, that's a, a bit redundant, permanent extinction. It is. Yeah. Well, yeah. but we're taking all of life along with us. And Good point, though. We can't see yeah. it. Why can't we see it? We can't see it because our the story we tell ourselves or we're being told by the mainstream media blocks it from our eyes. Don't pay attention to the pollution in the ocean. It's not relevant. Just go on listening to YouTube or just go on rocking out with iTunes or, you know, just, oh, but you got to pay money. You got to pay a dollar per song or whatever. Okay, so you've heard my rap, but for the members of your audience who haven't, we are no longer in a position where we control our system of money and economics. Our system of money and economics is in control of us all, all, from the top to the bottom and the bottom back up to the top. We at the bottom, so to speak, and I'm not, you and I are not at the bottom. I mean, we both have nice houses to live in. The people at the bottom are the ones out there in Waikiki trying to find an overhang to sleep under in the rain. If you ain't got money, you're detritus, you're refuse to be swept up when you pass away in the streets. Okay, oh, and people are going to say, oh, what a bleeding heart. But through the middle class, we're chained to the wheel with our mortgages and our student loans. Slaves. And our consumer debt. Debt is the chains of human bondage nowadays. Money. Mm -hmm. Money is created as debt. So, so I, I started at the bottom, the detritus, and I went through the, the supposedly middle class, us, the disappearing middle class in the United States. To the top, to the bankers. Oh, but the bankers, they can do anything they want. Ah, they can do anything they want as long as they don't violate the prime directive of the current operating system of humanity, which says make more money. So if some banker suddenly gets an epiphany and says, you know, what I've been doing has been destroying the world like, let's say Mark Carney, who is head of the Bank of England, and he is probably the closest to a person who might wake up of any I know. And if Mark Carney suddenly said, you know, our lending practices, we should not be lending for the building of a new runway at Heathrow because that is against the survival of humanity, he would be fired. Yeah. So he is also beholden to the system. But he probably wouldn't even conceptualize that because he was schooled within a paradigm that they teach in the business schools universally as economics. But in fact, it's neoclassical growth economics. Oh, yep. it's a particular flavor. It's a brand that was put in place by J.P. Morgan in the Chicago School of Business Economics Department when he funded the chair early in the, the 20th century. And since then, it's become the vogue to the point where you no longer call it neoclassical economics. It's economics. Oh, there's another kind? Uh, duh, yeah. Well, I didn't know that. Yeah, because they won't let it be taught in the economics department. You've got to teach it in the fringe sustainability or some, you know. You know, it's almost like every night when everyone around the world goes to bed, they put headphones on and all night long, a voice is playing back over and over again that growth is good, growth equals prosperity. We must grow. We must grow. It's not almost. It is like that. And whether or not they put the headphones on or whether they're just catching fragments in the news or yep. it's, it's all over there. And even when it's not the message is not explicit, it's implicit. That is, if you open a newspaper and you think, Oh, even if one of the free newspapers, that's the best example that they give out in some cities, you know, where it's, it's basically an advertising rag. Mm -hmm. And what supports them is the advertisements. So you think, oh, I'm tricking them. I'm only reading the news. I'm not looking at the advertisements. They got you. I used to teach critical thinking and I would tell my students that an advertisement that you look at, at least you have the cognitive filter to say, to give it the, the, the litmus test, the bullshit test. Yeah. But if you're not looking at it, if it's coming in out of the corner of your eye, then it's going, it's still going in, but it's going in surreptitiously. It's the equivalent of subliminal advertising. Yeah. Perfectly legal. Put an ad on the, per, a Lexus, somewhere on the fridge. A Lexus with a pretty girl leaning on it. You know, the classic. 
And, you know, it's so perfectly delivered because most of the people delivering it don't even realize that ah, that yeah. it's Kool-Aid. No fingerprints, right? You've gotten in, you've garroted your victim, and no fingerprints. All right, so back to your uh, the history of... Oh, yes. So how I got into what I'm doing. So yeah. over the years, over the decades, I would try to start a project uh, that would have earth-shaking, or profound, shall we say, uh, impacts, and I could never get traction. I was always too small. I was started doing this before the days of the internet. Uh, you know, during the uh, uh, Iran hostage crisis, I came up with one great idea, and I tried putting it over, but it had to be done paper-based by people faxing or mailing something to you. Well, I finally got traction when I connected with Al Gore, and I was part of his uh, they called it the climate project back then. And since they've added reality as a reframing to try to push back against the deniers until I realized that I was consistently going well beyond his messaging. Al Gore messages to the middle ground. Now, he doesn't care about the deniers so much. He doesn't care about the near term extinction people that much. He, you know, he's looking for the we can do this crowd. And he's he's. I, I got to acknowledge him. He's doing very good for bringing the bulk of humanity along gradually towards a realization of greater urgency. Yep. But I go straight for the the six sigma out there. That's a statistical term for your audience, meaning I'm way, way out there ahead saying we have to message about the urgency of this problem all the time. But do it in a way that doesn't scare people, if that's possible. <laughs> and so that's where I come in. And so my messaging has been tuned over the years to being able to say jaw-dropping things, but in a way that does not make you wet your pants. You know, it's like, instead, it makes you say, okay, tell me what to do. Okay, what should I be doing? Now, some people don't react that way, but I'm looking to empower the people who do. Now, I'll mention another person who, who occupies a similar territory, because he may be well known to your audience, Guy McPherson. Uh -huh. And he is Dr. Doom. You know, he has made pronouncement after pronouncement about near-term human extinction, and he's absolutely certain of it, and he disempowers a lot of people. And I've gone, direct, I've gone to him and at him directly, trying to unseat that absolute certainty, which is disempowering. We occupy a similar space in that we're talking about the possibility, but to him it's a certainty, of our killing ourselves and taking most of life down with us. Okay, so my job over the years has been to refine my message and my delivery of that message to the point where I can wake up as many people as possible so that we might, together, leaning on that proverbial rudder of the Titanic, we can't avoid the iceberg. But we might graze off it in a way that doesn't destroy enough of our, our flotation chambers to sink us. Might. It might come as a surprise to some people who haven't heard you or me speak before, I suppose. It would be a surprise to them that we're that close to the iceberg. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, OK. Well, let's let's talk to that part of our audience, our mutual audience. Uh, my audience, more or less, will be used to that because they will see this as a video on YouTube. And the channel, you can get there easily by scientistswarning.tv, which just forwards you to my YouTube channel. And the thread of what we've been discussing is in all the videos in one way or another. Any links we talk about, I'll put in the show notes for anyone who's listening Thank you. Uh, Thank to you. the podcast and is riding their bike or Thank you. on the treadmill and can't write those down. Yeah. <laughs> riding their treadmill. Or they're otherwise plugged into the rat race. It's kind of funny how we, I was saying something about rat race to someone this morning. And, you know, the images of wage slave and, and rat race and treadmill, you know, the little hamster running on the treadmill, are not accidental. They are there by the nature of the economic system. And if I can figure out a way of tweeting it in 140 characters, what I said to a friend yesterday still goes 24 hours later that whether it was by divine right or military might or democratic subterfuge, the people at the top of the power pyramid have always managed somehow to use that imperative to keep us all 
working for them. So, you know, the emperors did it, the kings did it, the, uh, the supposed de democracies of earth now where you can literally buy your way in with enough money and enough clever hacking. Anyhow, yeah. we, we, we've got a big problem. Our control structures are out of control. So back to the, the thing. So I have succeeded in creating an audience kind of backed into it. But the message is we have very little time to wake up and turn things around. If that, I regard us in a probabilistic sense. No event is 100% certain unless it's past. That's what I used to teach when I taught statistics and probability. Fair enough. So even though it seems to me like a very high likelihood that we have terminated our lease on this planet, mm -hmm. we, to the extent that there still may be some wiggle room to avert an ecocide. Now, it's not just climate that's coming at us. That's the big one. That's the fastest one. But it's a combination of what I'm calling ecological stressors. And for those, if your audience wants to understand, if they want to venture down this rabbit hole a little ways further, go to scientistswarning.org and check it out because we try to present in a comprehensible way this three alarm fire that is raging in our house that we can't even see or smell because we're too glued to the tube, the boob yep. tube. And so. you're doing a great job of it. I love the sign in your, your background, we'll podcast to save the planet. Oh, that's great. I have a sign that I did, handwritten sign to hold with Greta Thunberg in uh, Stockholm the day that I went and I demonstrated with her on her Friday school strike. Yeah, I want to see that. And uh, we definitely want, should talk about Greta before we get to the end of this. So let me ask you a question. Are you, what's your training? Is it as a scientist? Or? I, I heard you thinking that, yeah. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> I assessed and I said, I left out a lot of things. Yeah, sure. So I, I have a, a pretty broad background, everything from A to Z. I, I've done a lot of science training. My undergraduate degree was at Columbia University and I took all the sciences. And then I did a, a master's in information science. And then I went to work for IBM now, between the bachelor's and the master's, I roamed around and I did my minstrel thing, which I mm -hmm. uh, mentioned. And, and I also worked on Wall Street for two years. I was the first, as far as I know, the first environmentalist stockbroker on Wall Street. Hmm. And I saved one of the, the eight and a half by 11 canary yellow 100% recycled flyers that I turned out. And it was hard to find 100% recycled paper then. And I had to stay late at night because every 20th copy or so jammed the, the printer because <laughs> they were not, you know, good, smooth paper. And I showed Merrill Lynch through a little bit of homegrown uh, market research that there was a huge demand for it. They were blown away by the response I got to 2,000 flyers that I handed out at an Earth Day celebration in New York. But they said, you can't do it here. Why? It's a great idea, you told me. Why can't I do it here? Because the companies are too small. You can't do your own research, and we can't afford to put a, an analyst just working for you, and blah, 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 blah. You have to go do it. Okay. So I was on Wall Street for a couple of years, and I learned a lot. I'll bet. Okay. I will say one of the highlights that I testified twice in New York and in D.C. at the uh, Jimmy Carter, then president, his hearings on alternative energy and waste pollution control. And they, the DOE sponsored some some hearings. And I testified twice uh, as a rep, the only representative of Wall Street. Wow. I mean, I was self-appointed. Nobody on Wall Street said, hey, Stuart, you come do it. You know, I was the only person who was listening back then. So I, I've gone through that. I um, uh, paid my dues in for many years as a technologist. I ended up software developer for IBM, for other famous and not so famous companies. And then I went into teaching when I felt that programming was changing too fast and I didn't want to have to retool and relearn a new, new set of languages and tools every th few years. Mm -hmm. It became a young man's game. And I went back into mathematics. I taught for about five years in high school and college. And I presented mathematics as the pattern with which the universe was created. 
Oh, interesting take on that. Yeah. And that allowed me to go back and forth between metaphysical and physical. And it was very fertile because I'm kind of a one foot in each world guy. So I, I have a, a, a long stint at teaching and teaching college. And that then was a natural jumping off point into this international work I do on climate now, where I'm essentially, and I call myself a professor without borders. So I am now in the profession. I use that carefully because I don't get paid for it. But I'm in the, the profession of teaching internationally how close we are to destroying ourselves, destroying the natural conditions of Earth in which we evolved and which are required to support our food chain. When I say our food chain, to support other forms of life. Mm -hmm. Okay, We were, shall we say, put here or allowed to be here in a respectful balance with other forms of life, where yes, we eat plants and we eat animals. Some of us prefer animals, some of us prefer plants. And I don't know if we'll ever get everybody to go 100% vegetarian or vegan. And I'm not 100%. I keep saying I'm moving in that direction, guys, but be that as it may, we consume other parts of nature, but we are consuming them rapaciously. Yes. And we are destroying the Earth's ability to produce them. So I, I cite this figure often. We've gone from a situation perhaps 150 or 200 years ago. I'm, I'm, I, I'm not going to be precise on the, the, the dates, but the, the metaphor is, is true. I've seen it in print, in authoritative forms. We've gone from being 2% of the biomass of the vertebrate animal kingdom about 200 years ago, say, to being 98% us and our livestock. Mm -hmm. So we've totally, totally reversed nature. Whereas wild animals used to be 98% from the ferret to the elephant, the wild animals used to be 98%. Okay, and now it's turned around and we and our cows and pigs and chickens are 98%. Yeah. And you may not see anything wrong with that implicitly, but doesn't that say to you that there may be something out of balance in the this network we call Mother Nature. We should definitely put that in the bucket of evidence, and there's plenty of other yeah, evidence, too. Yeah, yeah. So that's my job, and I'm always seeking ways and means of doing that. And interesting, I say ways and means, because in the United States, at least, we associate the term ways and means with political. Yeah. The committee that handles the money is called ways and means. And I want to strip that away, okay? Because the ways and means of accomplishing things in this world do not necessarily involve money. Okay, people keep telling me, oh, but you could do so much more if you were taking donations from, from listeners, if you were seeking funding from uh, sponsors or, or philanthropists. I say, uh, yes and no. And for me, it's more no than yes currently. Um, when I have people around me working who don't get paid, I know they're doing it for the right reason. Yeah. If they're doing it and getting paid, it creates all kinds of other things going on. Like, gee, I really can't do it today, but I have to put in eight hours, so let me turn my computer on and make believe. Money tends to create a master-slave relationship between the one paying the money and the one receiving the money. And that's not a natural arrangement. So anyhow, I like to run the thing I run only on volunteer help. So uh, in 2017, the World Scientist's Warning second notice. I discovered the Scientist's Warning in 2017, and I immediately said, my antenna is always up for anyone who is messaging well. Okay, And I said, this is good messaging. Because it says it's not just about the climate. It's about a whole lot of things. And it was su superb messaging because essentially climate as an issue had already been defeated. 
the waters had been clouded in multiple ways. So here was a new way of messaging saying, uh, yeah, climate's pretty bad and it's coming at us fast, but we're screwing ourselves in all kinds of ways. It was a litany of ways, and it was a peer-reviewed paper, and it had been signed by 15,000 scientists at publication. It was like huge. So I approached them and I said, you've left out one stakeholder in what you're doing. And they are headed by uh, Professor Bill Ripple. So when I say they, he represents a steering committee for this alliance of world scientists that formed out of the, the World Scientists Warning to Humanity second notice. Okay. And I said to Bill, Bill, you've left out one important stakeholder community. And he said, oh, what's that? And I said, the public. Your website invites scientists to come and sign. But there's nowhere the public can get involved. Would you let me do that part? Ah. So he said, well, show us what you had in mind. And so I went out, did an RFP, got some, some bids, ended up going with a group in India. And they came back overnight with a mock-up of what I described to them. I showed it to Bill and the steering committee. And they liked it. They said, go for it. So I became the public outreach arm. Ah. Uh which gives you the impression that I'm behind the whole thing. Yeah, I've gotten so used to just, uh, you know, the communication I see about this has got your name That's on it. That's the point, yeah. is they're scientists. Yep. They are receptive. If you want to get in touch with them for an interview or somebody's doing a, a documentary about the world side, fine. But they're, they're not media specialists. They're not outreach specialists. They're scientists. And when I've actually commented to Bill on the steering committee that... I'd love to see them more, slightly more activist, recommending things that we do, outreach to their group of 15,000 scientists. He says, uh, 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 we're not into that. That's your job. Yeah. I had a dream last night. I had this nightmare. And in the nightmare, I was in a, I live in Honolulu. I was in a high rise. I look out over high rises uh, in Waikiki and I was in one of them on the 22nd floor. And I was looking down at at the beach at Waikiki and I was seeing these 20 foot waves washing over the beach and the structures that were there in my view. <gasps> and then as the dream progressed, a little bit later in the dream, there was water lapping over the balcony. Ocean, I don't know if it was ocean water coming in or if it was water. From, <laughs> but it, and then I called my housemates, my roommates, and one of them opened the door and the water comes rushing in. You know, and it's like, and then the building starts to sway. Now, when I woke up and I th looked at the dream, 22nd floor, they estimate 10 feet per story. That put me 220 feet in the air. It's estimated that if all of the ice on the planet, the Himalayan ice pack, the Antarctic ice pack, if all the ice on the, all the glaciers, if they all melted, it would put about 210 feet of ocean rise so my dream was scientifically accurate. I was at sea level. I was in a building on the coast at 220 feet in the air, and the water was beginning to run over my balcony. What can I say? It was a highly symbolic dream, but it was mathematically correct. Amazing. <laughs> and thanks to you, because I never would have known what that number would be. Yeah, it's, about, it's said to be about 70 meters of ocean rise locked in the Himalayan ice pack and the Greenland and... Antarctica. Well, I'm going to guess that we'll never get there because of all the other, well, we can't survive climate change that long to begin with, but all the other existential crises. The earth may get there, but we will not survive that long. We will never get there. We won't live to see that if indeed it happens. Yeah. You know, we will long since be, I, I just felt something in my pocket. This is something that I, I purchased on the most remote beach on the island of Maui that you can get to, and it's a polished split fossil ammonite, the little snail shell. So it's like a chambered nautilus sort of, and this is 120 million years old. And I carry this as a totem sort of in my pocket so that I can pull it out and look at it and think I'm holding 120 million year old life remnant in my hand, and it's sobering. Because we, humanity, is on the verge of decimating life. We, we already have 75% of the biomass of insects around the world seem to be gone. 
much more in some places. Puerto Rico, after the uh, incredible devastation of that island from the hurricane last year, mm -hmm. scientists came down to the national park. I forget what it's called, but I know it's the El Yunque Mountain is in the middle of this national park. And they started doing soil samples to try to evaluate the health of the biome in the soil. And they found that 98% of what they expected to find was not there. For a long time, people have said, you don't need to save the planet. The planet's going to be just fine. And the planet is going to survive. But the, I think the scale of the human enterprise has outgrown the planet to such an extent that we are doing pretty serious damage to the planet yeah. and we irreversible yeah. yeah we need to feel guilty about that you're calling it the human enterprise this morning i was wrestling with a way of saying that phrase without using the word enterprise because that is part of the paradigm that we need to get away from we should say human culture or human civilization because we want to think we're civilized but instead it's the human enterprise as if the thing we're here to do is enterprise. Enterprise, very specifically, if it's not uh, the denotative definition of the word, it's the connotative way it's used. Enterprise means how you make money. Good point. So the human enterprise is how do we make money out of the planet? It's locked into the way we think. Yeah. You know, it's part of the paradigm. The paradigm is a, a habitual way of behaving and thinking that we don't even see. But it's so good that the scientists have someone like you who's thinking about those things and evaluating carefully how to get what they have been trying. To, well, what they haven't been trying hard enough to communicate to the rest no. of us. They no. need someone like you to try yeah. to communicate to the general public. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the, uh, the appreciation. So to the uninitiated, uh, World Scientist Warning Second Notice issued, I guess you're saying it was issued in December of 2017. Now, there's some history behind that, and that is the first warning. There was a World Scientist Warning back in 1992. Yeah. In 1992, the Union of Concerned Scientists in Washington, D.C. published a one-page, I'll call it a manifesto, it wasn't quite that, but it was a warning. It was the first world scientist's warning to humanity. It was a half-page saying that we are causing serious and irreversible harm to the planet and ourselves. And unless we change what we're doing, we will cause huge human misery and suffering. That's a pretty good paraphrase. Uh -huh. Well, we didn't do much. What? We didn't? It fell on deaf ears. We didn't. No. <laughs> well, we did a lot, excuse me, but we didn't do what they were telling us we needed to do. Yeah. We made a lot more money. I love saying this. We proceeded to tear down the Amazon rainforest in part to build the world's biggest mercantile establishment, Amazon. <laughs> We are losing the Amazon rainforest while Amazon.com becomes the biggest marketplace on Earth. Yep. Uh, something wrong with this picture? Okay. So that warning went largely unheeded. It was easy to ignore. It was a blip. Didn't even make a big impact in terms of, of public attention. Well, 25 years later, this group of scientists led by Bill Ripple realized we are screwed if we don't wake up. Mm -hmm. And so they issued this second warning. Same name, World Scientists Warning to Humanity. Second notice. And I say it's final notice. We're not going to get another notice. We're not going to get another warning, I don't think. There won't be time. And so now we are closer to the falling off, the over-the-edge condition. Mm -hmm. And my belief is we are over the edge and have to scramble back to safety as quickly as possible, if it's still possible. That's my job. I'm the cheerleader for scrambling back to safety, one of the cheerleaders. And so that became this world scientist warning to humanity that now I'm trying to force it down everybody's throat. Look at this. Look at this. It's important for your kids. And guess what? For you. So Bill Ripple and what, one or two other colleagues are listed as authors on this paper. But they're eight total, but two of them were the most uh, active. Okay, so they published this paper. They published that paper, and then because there was a huge demand for it, that is, it was really well cited, and they got lots of interviews uh, initially, they created something that they call the Alliance of World Scientists, 
And the website for the Alliance of World Scientists is on the Oregon State University server. Mm -hmm. So it comes out at osu.edu. And that's their website. To me, it was not engaging or exciting. It was an appeal to scientists to sign the warning. And so I they allowed me to do this website, which was the public interface. And then they allowed me to reach out to their 20,000 mailing list saying I'm going to be doing these programs at the climate talks in December, that is December of 2018. Mm -hmm. And would any of you like to join me as guests or or to help put them over? And I got some very, very good responses. The co-host, Victoria Hirth from the UK, she came to me through the World Scientists Warning. Ah, She was one of their signatories and a fellow by the name of Peter Skubala, a Polish fellow scientist ecologist. He wrote me right away and he said, I live in Katowice, which is where the climate talks were. And oh, if it had not been for Peter, oh boy, did he, I can't begin to say how helpful he was. They allowed me also to do these programs under the banner scientistswarning.tv. And they were very pleased. I was hoping that they would be pleased with the results because my editorial input that I always inject into my programs is what we're doing here, is that our growth economics is killing us. And I didn't know whether they would like that or not. And a couple times I used a strong word. I was highly critical of the idiot in chief. I wasn't sure, but they really liked the programs and they sent the link out to 20,000 of their scientists. So So for uh, anyone who is really now just discovering uh, Stuart Scott or just discovering World Scientist Warning, in a nutshell, you kind of created a little TV network at COP24. Yep, yep, yep. And the TV network goes back to uh, 2015 in Paris when I managed to successfully getting Dr. James Hansen, who I call the Paul Revere of climate change. Mm -hmm. He was the first scientist to go public in testimony before Congress saying that climate change is here. He called it global warming. We all called it global warming back then until we realized that much or most of humanity was not nuanced enough in their thinking. And I'm being kind there. A lot of them were ideologically opposed. And so if it wasn't warmer every single day than the day before, what global warming? You know, snow, an unusually large amount of snow in the winter meant oh, ho, 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 when in fact more snow is indicative of warmer winters. But that we'll, we'll leave that little technicality out of the picture. But let me mention that uh, when I interviewed Paul Ehrlich for my documentary Growth Busters, he told me that he liked the term climate disruption. He wasn't suggesting that we use it because, you know, climate change had already yeah. taken hold. And I really think climate disruption is a much better uh, description of it than climate change or even climate catastrophe. Or destabilization. Yeah, but search engine optimization requires that we keep talking about climate change. So uh, I'll be sure to include uh, links in the show notes. Uh, I want to make sure people have a chance to see the great videos that you uh, have been producing at uh, scientistswarning.tv. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, you, and you didn't stop just because COP24 was over. You're continuing to oh, yeah, produce new yeah. video content. I'm closing a couple of parentheses here. The TV, the branding as a TV came out of, out of COP, uh, what was it, 21 in Paris when I had thought I was going to be filming a documentary there. And I'd managed to get a retired TV news cameraman from England to come down and film for me for free for the price of his lodging. You know, I just paid his ticket and his lodging for him and his uh, assistant. And and he filmed for me for free. And at the end, he said, you know, Stuart, I don't want to be a wet blanket, but I don't think you have a movie here, but I do think you have a brand. And so he put it in my mind that climatematters.tv was a viable brand. And so with that in mind, I've been angling toward that. And yes, I've managed to turn these free resources that the UNFCCC gives to any NGO, non-governmental organization, that is accredited and shows up at the talks. I mean, that's a whole other level of administrative bureaucracy. But as long as I get there, for the price of paying a ticket and lodging, I get a press conference room, which is my soundstage. Mm-hmm. 
and they have four cameras and they have a sound controller and they have a mixer who edits it all together. And then I set up a couple of GoPro cameras. And so I have B-roll shots from side angles. And so I basically, I'm in charge of filming my, my own work. And then I send it off to a team of video editors. So that turned into the scientists warning TV brand, you know, with the from climate matters TV, I broadened the scope to it's an ecological problem of which climate is the leading edge. But that allowed me to very directly discuss the elephant in the room population. It allows me to discuss any of the ways in which we are assaulting our mother, Mother Nature. And of course, you scored beautifully by having Greta Thunberg, the 15-year-old superstar of COP24, on a couple of your uh, four. TV episodes. Four. I consider myself the luckiest person in that people I'm working with in Stockholm, they have a project called We Don't Have Time.org. Last Earth Day, they did the first no-fly world summit on climate. They had people videoing in. I had to wake up at 2 a.m. to be ready to go by 3 a.m. because um, I'm on the other side of the, the world from them. And I'm working with them and they mentioned that Greta was going to be, blah, 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 Gre you know Greta Thunberg? They said, oh yes, yes, yes. And so can you introduce me? And that turned into her father and she driving down to Poland and uh, being on four of my programs. And the first one was her alone. And usually my guests are on stage with me, but that one I said, no, my instincts were have her sitting in the front row and introduce her and have everybody applaud her because she was already becoming world famous. And I put on the last slide, if you'd want to interview, if anybody wants to interview Greta, his her father's name and phone number. And he said his phone did not stop ringing after that. So she became world famous. She was invited to Davos, World Economic Forum, where she very expertly stuck her fingers in the eyes of the assembled uh, glitterati and said, the quote, the paraphrase is, there are many people and companies and leaders who are knowingly stealing our future, destroying our future, so that a few people can make enormous sums of money. And some of you are in this audience. At the end of her two minutes speaking, there was a long, strained silence broken by Bono of rock and roll fame starting the, the, the meager applause. Greta is a blessing. She and AOC. And so I got her and her father the badges for week one of the COP. And Antonio Guterres, the secretary general of the UN, gave them their badges for week two. And at what point did uh, they invite her to speak as part of the conference? The COP officially started on Sunday. And when I asked, if you needed another day, which you knew you would, why didn't you add it on at the end? And they said, because the first day nothing gets done. So we wanted to make the first day a wasted day, Sunday, so that the second day, Monday, would then be a, we, everybody's ready for work. They're settled into their hotel. They know where the bathrooms are, where the lunchroom is, and they're ready to go. So that was their logic. So she and her father came on Sunday, arrived in Poland, and came to the cop to get their badges. And I don't know whether they met him or how it came about, but a member of the Swedish negotiating team met them. Again, I don't know how that came about. And told the UN that they were there. And so Antonio Guterres passed back to them an invitation for Greta to appear at a private meeting he was having with youth with global youth, a few youth leaders from around the world before the COP Monday morning. And so she participated in that. And it was extremely private. I was not allowed in. She brought with her a cameraman who was filming for a documentary that was being made about her in, in Sweden. They wouldn't allow him in. Mm. But someone recorded that, and that's available up on my website. The, the two minutes that she spoke to world leaders sitting between the head of the UN and the head of the climate talks at the UN. And again, she has this way of pointing her finger gently as only a 15, now she's 16, can do, but with clarity and power and innocence all at the same time. Oh, what a blessing she is. So back to world science, uh, let's see, scientistwarning.org. First of all, that is a website 
where anyone can access that scientist warning second notice. And I think there's a link to the original yep. 1992 scientist yep. warning there, too. So you can get that. You can read it. It's short. You can share that. You can learn a lot more. But also, there is something else that people can do for you, for the scientists, yeah. for our future, yeah. right, at that website. Right. And it's not, it's not donate. Right. There's no donate button. Occasionally, I'll get a comment from somebody, I noticed there's no donate button on your website. That speaks volumes. We need engagement, involvement from the people who come. That is, we are always looking for people to say, I've got some spare time, how can I help? I've already mentioned video editing. We need translation. We need people to translate our videos, subtitles for, we need a lot of things. But there's also a wiki under the menu item, learn and act. And people can go there to learn more and to figure out what is doable in their situation, okay? One of the big ones that I'm emphasizing right now is civil disobedience. Now, I cannot probably legally encourage children to skip school, but I can mention that there are a hell of a lot of kids doing it right now, taking their future in their hands, realizing that they're being screwed, okay? And Jim Hansen, Dr. James Hansen, said that in Paris when I presented him publicly. He said, world leaders came here and at the end of the talks, they're going to pat one another on the back and said, we did good. We had a good result here. You know, we're going to handle climate change. If they do that, then they're screwing the next generation and all the following ones. He was nervous about saying he was playing with his microphone, but he said it. And that's really where that's at. You know, we are screwing and the kids who are realizing they're getting screwed i mean they're not stupid and they're beginning to say this doesn't go down and we won't go to school we will not obey your law because we're preparing for a future that you're destroying won't be there you may be not able to see it but we can we haven't bought into the system yet we don't have student loans that force us to take a job that we're not happy about you know yeah so we're seeing a revolution. It's like the Greek play Lysistrata, where the women come rushing out on, well, no, they don't do it in, the, in the, quite this way, but it's two warring sides in early Rome, I think, are going to go to war, and the women decide they've had enough of this, and they're going to deny marital pleasure to their husbands on both sides until the husbands agree to a truce. And it worked in the play, and our kids are saying that to us. So, can individual members of the public, are you, is there a place to sign up to endorse the World Scientist Warning, or is that only for scientists and organizations? No, 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 no. You, uh, on the Alliance of the World Scientists website, they are still calling for scientists only to sign. Uh -huh. We are calling for everyone, including scientists, to sign. Okay. Now, they don't share their mailing list with us, because that was their agreement, but we are willing to share ours with them. So, if any scientists come in and sign with us, then we will be presenting that group as co-signatures, and those will go on the, uh, the main OSU website also. So please come to scientistswarning.org, O-R-G, and there is a join menu item. And you go under there and you can join as an individual. If you have an organization that you represent, anything from a garden club to an NGO, you know, and then you can sign as a scientist. So as an individual, as an organization, or as a scientist, you can endorse slash sign the warning. So please come. Thank you. Good to talk to you. Well, that was a journey down several corridors in the mind of Stuart Scott, Executive Director of the Union of Concerned Citizens of Earth. We touched on many topics and several links were mentioned, so be sure to hit the show notes for further reading and some viewing. Also in the show notes will be links to a two-part essay just published in the TAI, an online news magazine published in British Columbia, Canada. The essay was written by Bill Rees, who I consider one of the brightest minds on the unsustainability of human civilization as we know it. Rees is Professor Emeritus of Human Ecology and Ecological Economics at the University of British Columbia. Back in 1996, Bill and one of his students, Matis Wackernagel, developed the concept of ecological footprint. Wackernagel went on to found the Global Footprint Network, which annually computes the total biocapacity of the planet, 
and the total demand human beings are making of the earth. In other words, how far we are into overshoot. Be sure to check the show notes for a link to our episode with Walker Noggle earlier this year. This week, the Taiyi published a two-part essay recently penned by Reese. The essay makes two queries. The first, the modern world is deeply addicted to fossil fuels and green energy is no substitute. Am I wrong? The second, human nature and our methods of governance are proving incapable of saving the world. We need to get real about climate science. Am I wrong? Let me share a few highlights just to whet your appetite so you'll be sure to look these up. From Reese, policy for climate disaster avoidance seems designed to serve the capitalist growth economy and make the latter appear as the solution rather than the cause of the problem. He also wrote, The international community, despite the Paris Accord, Greta Thunberg, climate strikes, and mass public protests, seems determined to stay its growth-driven, fossil-fueled course. The Green New Deal won't do the trick. Now, on the Green New Deal subject, in this essay, Reese proposes an 11-point Green New Deal that he believes might have a chance of saving human civilization. You'll want to read that. And finally, from his essay, Disastrous climate change and energy shortage are near certainties in this century, and global societal collapse a growing possibility that puts billions at risk. Now, when William Reese speaks, we should all listen. If you're interested in hearing more from Reese, listen to episode 105 of the Conversation Earth podcast, which I hosted a few years ago. Link in the show notes. That's it for this edition of the Growth Busters podcast. Be sure to visit growthbusters.org for more. Please share and recommend this episode with other people who you know need some enlightenment. And by all means, subscribe to this podcast. You don't want to miss an episode and it costs you nothing to subscribe. Also, I might mention, as I rarely do, this is a nonprofit project and it is fueled by what I would consider renewable energy. Will you help us renew that energy with a donation? There's a link at growthbusters.org to make it easy for you to support this podcast, either on a one-time or a recurring basis. And I thank you for that. Until next time, this is Dave Gardner. Thank you for listening. And thank you for doing your best to live sustainably. Some may dream to paint mountains and streams, but not me. I'm a growth buster. Some may just want more, but don't know what it's for, but not me. I'm a growth buster. Don't want a solution at the cost of pollution They think bigger is better at the cost of the weather But no, not us, we are the growth busters Calling, 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 calling Call the growth busters